Cool, I think I got it, hopefully. So uh, welcome back, everybody. I guess this is my last lecture of the term. So, um, and then I get to hear from you guys on Thursday, which I'm super excited about. I've been hearing a bunch of exciting projects going on. <clears throat> I wanted to end with, um, with one topic that I kind of, you know, we could spend a semester on probably, but uh, um, I think it's a nice, I think I can say a few things about this today that kind of follows on what we talked about last time about input output models and recurrent models and all these things we talked about for the plant. What I want to talk about today a bit is, is the implications of those kind of representations when you're, when you're representing the controller. And, um, and I want to do that in the context of this output feedback. So um, let me set it up and start in, uh, in the, on the whiteboard here, I guess. Okay, so the output feedback problem is embraces the fact that just like last time in system identification, we were doing input output system identification, right? We had our plant model. Has some internal state. We've been calling X, but really we only have inputs and outputs um, and potentially noisy measurements or, or partial observations of that state on the outputs, right? Um, so in general, we've, we've generalized ourselves to thinking about dynamical systems of the form. We can do discrete or continuous time. We can have noise or disturbances but we also have an output. Okay, you know, and one important example of that that we spent some time on and we will return to again is in the linear systems case. I can put a matrix in front of that or, or not. We use another a different letter for the observe, the measurement noise just to keep it make it clear that those are probably uncorrelated. Okay, so the big question is, given a system of this form, how do we design the feedback? And I'm sort of embarrassed to say, I mean, so of course, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about over the course of the semester will still be useful, okay? But actually we haven't squarely addressed this sort of pretty fundamental problem yet. So before we leave the semester, let me, let me say a few things about it, okay? So, um, you know, the, the big idea here is that LQR, for instance, as our toy system gave us U equals negative KX, we can't execute that anymore, right? So um, we don't have direct access to X. What about um, as a replacement, we've talked about <clears throat> controllers of the form U equals negative KY, right? That's a totally reasonable thing to think about. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a couple reasons why that is immediate. You can just see in the equations immediately why that's potentially worse than X, right? So first of all, Y has measurement noise, right? So um, I might get a noisy, uh, even, if, even if C was the identity matrix, so I really, I'm getting almost a copy of X out, but I'm getting a noisy copy of X out. If, if V is drawn from a Gaussian or something, then you don't know, you, you might not wanna send Gaussian noise through your actuator, especially if you've got some high-end, high-performance actuator, um, you might not be happy with you if you do that. Um, and your robot will shake. <laughs> so so um, there's another problem with that, is that if C is not full rank, right, then um, if C were to be uh, a short uh, and wide matrix, right, 
then um, y is a lower dimension than x. And that's the easiest way to sort of see that you have only a partial observation of your state. Okay, it can be that if you watch over time, then you can infer everything about x, but from an instantaneous snapshot of y, you cannot um, understand x, right? So there's a difference between sort of being partially observable in the sense you, you can still be observable, right? You can still infer x over uh, many samples, even if you can't instantaneously infer it. Okay, so, um, but this, this problem, this version of the problem here, even in the linear case, because of those potential challenges, in particular that C being low rank challenge, um, we actually, we talked about this once before in the policy search. I gave this in the list of examples of, of things that work and things that don't work. Um, we, we said, for instance, in LQR, you can actually just do gradient descent on K and that works. And that's sort of amazing that you can find the optimal solution just by doing gradient descent on K. But if you do gradient descent on K here in an output feedback, and in particular, this is called static output feedback. You'll understand the static versus dynamic hopefully very well in a few minutes. Okay, but, but this was actually the bad case where we can give you examples where doing gradient descent on K is, um, is not gonna lead to happiness. Uh, and in general, finding even the optimal K that solves for some LQR kind of objective for this is known to be a hard problem, like in an NP hardness sense. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let me just uh, put that example up. Hopefully that, yeah, that was, this was that example, right? It was just a very simple system that uh, had three X variables, but only one Y variable, a scalar Y. Okay, and then, um, oh, my, my X axis label fell off, but this is the K. So, so if I basically now, it, since Y is a scalar, when I write U equals, and U is a scalar, right? In this case, then the matrix K that I would search for, U equals KX, negative KX, K is just a scalar. So what I plotted here, just to convince you that it's an ugly problem, is that if I change different values of K on the X axis, my label fell off, I apologize. And I plot the eigenvalues of the closed loop eigenvalues, right? Just is the system stable or not depends only on whether that blue line is below the black line. Okay. And the point is there's some parts over here by the, you know, between 0.5 and, and one where the system is stable. Some values of K where the systems are stable. There's other values of K greater than two where the system is stable okay but if you started in one if in order to get to the other one if you're in the if you started in the wrong one you might have a stable solution but you actually have to go through an unstable solution to get back to a stable solution and in general this is you know that's just as gradient descent doesn't work but in general this problem is non-convex and known to be you we're, we're not going to find a convex um solution to it because it's NP hard. That would be sort of a P equals NP kind of thing. So, <clears throat> um, so maybe just using static output feedback doesn't feel like the magical answer. So what can we do instead? I had a question about the like intolerance of like LQR when you have noisy observations. So if your C matrix is identity, but you're getting some Gaussian noise. Yeah. I'm a little surprised that like Gaussian noise can really like hurt your controller. I guess in like an L2 sense, at what point does the L2 gain kind of sense? Like at what point does Gaussian noise start to actually hurt your controller? Cause um, if, if you're just zero me, yeah, that's a great control. question. So, so, and let me try to be careful about it. So um, it's, it's a zero, if it's zero mean, Gaussian noise, then um, then actually the optimal thing to do is still the LQR controller. It doesn't change what the optimal controller is, but your cost goes up, mm -hmm. right? And in particular, you wouldn't, um, yeah, so, so there's, there's a question of whether there's process noise, uh, but you can still observe X perfectly, right? In which case, just doing state feedback on X is, is still the original LQR is still the optimal thing to do. 
if you have measurement noise, then you are going to get into this kind of stuff. Then you really have to think about it that that is having a, an output y, and uh, and starting to do the type the observer based things we're about to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. The optimal thing to do is no longer to send your noise directly through to your actuators in an LQR sense. But I mean, you could ask, how does the performance degrade, right? I think that's the question you're, you're asking. Um, yeah, it shouldn't be hard to, to, to write that down. Um, I think it's a performance degradation more than a conversion of stable into unstable for linear systems, right? But if you are doing a linear system on a non-linear -linear controller on a non-linear system, then it could change your region of attraction for sure. Okay, so the standard improvement here is to start thinking about observer-based feedback. Okay, so um, now you might have seen this in many different ways or or um, by many different names, but let me give you the canonical sort of controls version of it would be like the simplest generic nonlinear observer, potentially nonlinear observer would be a Lundberger observer. What a Lundberger observer is, it's, this is an, another name for this would be state estimation. These are all synonymous. Okay, but a Lundberger observer is a standard observer of the form where I'm going to call X is my estimate, it's my state estimate, my estimate of the true state X. Okay. <clears throat> so this would be just um, if I took my my previous estimate x hat and I sent it through my model. So this is the case where we we trust that we know the model exactly. We can of course add uncertainty about that also. But if we trust that we know our model exactly, we just don't know the state. We do have the luxury of knowing u exactly. We can, if we were just optimistic and said the noise was zero and I propagated that through, then I'd get a new x hat, an open loop x hat. But I can do better than that because I'm getting observations of my state through y. So how do you feed that back in? Well, you can put a simple sort of linear term on here that brings in the differences between the y you expected and the given the x hat and the y you actually received. Okay, so the y I expected here is my again using my model. This is the uh, expected observation and measured. And this thing is called the observer game. So in the, in the simple case, of course, um, for linear systems, this you can write all that down. But if, um, if properly chosen, L, then what you'd like, you'd like to have some guarantee that X hat goes to X as you get more samples, right? That's sort of the, the basic role of an observer. Uh, in the stability sense, we think about asymptotics, but of course you might ask for, um, for some finite convergence of your estimate. Uh, but for linear systems, the natural thing to ask for is some sort of exponential rate of convergence of your estimate to the true X, right? So, uh, in the special case of linear, if I have x hat n plus one You can actually see this. Um, 
you can write down the error dynamics directly. So if I wanted to write down x hat minus x, right? You can say what's x hat n plus one minus x hat n minus, uh, uh, yeah, if I were to, let me. If you write all this out, right, then you get this term is here. This term actually cancels out a few of them, right? Because this one is like, these two are identical for the Bs and for the Ds. Those just cancel out. And what you're left with is actually something simple, A minus LC X hat N minus XN. plus your noise terms. So this just tells me if I choose L so that A minus LC is, to, is stable, then I'm in good shape. Now that's in some, from our perspective, in some sense, this is kind of a simple or narrow result, I guess, compared to the full, you know, a humanoid robot or something, but it actually is still at the core of what we need to understand. Okay. And I think um, thinking through some of the implications of this kind of a design uh, is, is actually very powerful, even for the nonlinear systems. Okay. So there's a bunch of things you, you might've heard about, right? Um, Kalman filter is a, is a standard thing that, um, that people have a sense for, you might've used. Um, so the, how does this connect, right? For linear Gaussian systems, the, um, the optimal observer gain is given by the, con the Kalman filter. So if you hear Kalman filter, think of that as just a way to design L, okay? It happens, it's a way to design L that is deeply connected to all the things we've done before. Right. The, um, in particular, it's, it's deeply connected to LQR solutions. It's um, the Kalman filter uh, is the solution of a Riccati equation. Very much like LQR. And there's a infinite horizon version of it. Steady state version of it, right? That's the steady state solution of the, you know, or the algebraic Riccati equation. So if you're gonna build a, a filter for a linear system around a fixed point, then you, you linearize the dynamics, you call LQR to get, get K in the same sort of way you would linearize your dynamics, okay? And you would call your common filter design it solves a couple of Riccati equations in the background and it gives you a, the optimal L, okay? There's also a time varying version of this, a finite horizon version. It gives you time varying observer gains. L is a function of N in this case, or, or T if, it's, if you're doing a continuous time. Okay, so let me just walk through um, a, a version of that with a couple results here. So um, an example here would be, let's balance the Acrobot. Um, 
but we're gonna use only position measurements. We're gonna to have to back out the velocity from looking out at multiple positions. Okay, and just does not switch computers. I, I will, um, I won't run it, but I, it's all, it all exists in code, right? So I made a little diagram, Acrobat plant. We have a, um, a little system that you, we can add in for, it's called rotary encoders. So this has got my torques coming in. This is my, the Acrobat plant exposes its full state, right? It's, uh, it doesn't make any um, me limited measurement model, but the rotary encoders is gonna somehow down select that and be my Y, okay? The, y, the rotary encoders is in the simplest case is just basically a C matrix that says, I'm gonna pick off the first two state va variables and reveal them perfectly. But um, uh, it can be more advanced than that. It's that we have, you know, sometimes the encoder models actually quantize the, the signal the way that they actually do. Sometimes we explicitly account for encoder calibration errors or slip or other things. Let's just do the simplest one first. Okay, I can also add noise in my measurement noise in here. And then I'm gonna send that to my Kalman filter. Which is another dynamical system that I get the same way I, I, you know, just, I call the function. I said, design me a Kalman filter and I add it to the diagram, right? And this gives me X hat coming out. Can send it to my LQR controller, get my U, send it back around. Okay, so um, again, all the all the code is there, and we can you can run it if you like. But let me just show you effectively what happens because I want to think about what happens um, here. So first of all, there's you know the observer takes in, I should have actually been more careful and drawn one more error. I have the observed system input and the observed um, system output that has to go in. I actually have to feed you around to my Kalman filter too, and it estimates the state. But we have Kalman filters and all these things are just functions. The, the Kalman filters are functions you call, it'll design you a system. And there's these Leuenberger observer systems that are just sitting right there for you. Okay, so if you run your Acrobat uh, with Kalman, LQR with Kalman filter, then you see the same sort of dance that we always see. But if you really look at it with uh, with eyes that have looked at a lot of acrobats, then it, it does look a little bit different. Okay, so um, the first thing you see is that the, the system does still with the LQR controller, uh, stabilize the nonlinear system to the fixed point. So this is just the true acrobat state, the first and second joint, and it does converge to the desired upright configuration, even though it's not, okay? But what's also interesting is that you can watch the error dynamics of the estimator. You can look at X hat versus X. And there's actually, I mean, those aren't huge numbers here, but there's there's a significant transient where it has to figure out where the heck it is um, in the initial. I assumed I gave it, I made it optimistic because I'll assume I'm at the top, but I actually started at some slightly different angle. It takes a second to figure out where the heck it is and then stabilize its error to, um, to zero, but it does converge to zero. In fact, when you plot A minus LC, it's, um, you know, they're all safely, the eigenvalues of A minus LC are all safely negative real parts. It's a, it's a stable observer that comes out of the, the Kalman filter and, um, and life is good. We get a, a stable solution, okay? But when, if you remember this very early on, I showed you the Acrobat, okay? And if you look, the experimental acrobat. One of the things that's always driven me crazy is that it gets to the top, it doesn't fall down, but it does not asymptotically converge beautifully to the real fixed point, right? There's a bunch of details hiding in the inside of that that make this thing work or not work, okay? 
And as you increase your levels of detail, I think a lot of those are not actually in the control. I mean, some of them are in the control design, but most of them actually are in the, some of the details of estimation and the like. So let's just hit a few of those details. Um, okay, so first of all, I argued with a single trace on a single plot that this thing works, right? Um, but, but if we actually wanted to analyze it working, then what, you know, what would it take to verify, even find a region of attraction of this system, even this idealized system? What's the state space? How big is the state space of my of this diagram I've drawn? I've got four states here for sure. The encoders aren't adding any state. The controller is a static feedback. But this Kalman filter actually does have state, right? So it's four more states here. That are getting added right in from the Kalman filter, right? It's got a running x hat, a copy of x that, for its own that for its own purposes, it has to keep a history of those, you know, a history of everything it's seen in its x hat. Okay, so I can totally do sums of squares on this problem, but um, now I'm now I'm already. Um, sums of squares or your favorite approach now has to work in eight state variables. And it has more dynamics kicking, right? It's got two copies of the dynamics shifted, right? But plus the observer dynamics or the observer gain coming in, right? Um, so we just took our problem that we were happy with and we're living in, you know, but we just made it at least twice as hard. <laughs> okay. Um, and people, we, we have to do that in order to sort of say anything about the actual performance of the system. And we've been sloppy so far by not doing it. Um, I think a lot of the papers don't, don't do it, but in practice, you kind of have to do it to be, um, to have any reasonable guarantee. What would you expect the performance of this system to be like, um, for instance, the size of the region of attraction of this system compared to the size of, of the system that just had the simpler LQR, where I just took X directly, you know, this would be my straw man system would be, I could put X directly here. How have the dynamics effectively changed? or qualitatively change, let's say. I mean, filters like the Kalman filter are beautiful and magical for rejecting noise, but they don't come for free. You are adding delay into your system It takes you know, it takes time to look at a couple observations and um, and converge. I should say more carefully, it's a lag. It's a lag, right? It's a um, it's a you're adding state variables, right? Um, in the continuous or in the well, either in continuous or discrete time, it's a state space um, low pass filter of your noise, which will slow down your response of your total closed loop system, right? It, it reduces the performance of your controller. And if you continue to, if your system has more and more noise, then your Kalman filter gains have to be more and more, they have to take a longer history effectively of observations to give good estimates. And you will, you will further slow down your ability to respond to disturbances, okay? So in practice, if you're looking at trajectories, you would expect the response of your controller um, for the filtered system from observations to be slower and 
more encumbered, less capable than the original one. And now I can't say anything absolute about how this linear system would affect the nonlinear dynamics, but I would expect that your your region of attraction is going to get a lot get smaller as soon as you account for more of these that that reduction in possible performance of your controller. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And it only gets worse with more noise, okay? Even though the Kalman filter can be designed optimally. All right, and then there's all these other interesting aspects that I want to, uh, that we need to potentially model and account for um, on the Acrobat exactly, you know, but in other systems too. For instance, um, we do have, we definitely have encoder calibration offsets. And I talked about that before. That's a bummer because, you know, if you if you are trying to balance yourself straight up and you think you're straight up, but you're actually kind of over here, well, you're going down, right? So, um, so having even a small uh, kinematic calibration offset, which is, you know, encoders can slip. You, uh, you can, that, that's easy to have happen. That can be a big, nuisance in, in an Acrobat balancing controller. So we end up often adding yet another system on top of this to, to do an online adaptive estimate of the encoder offsets, just to make sure we're not walking away from those. Um, there's encoder uh, quantization. If it's an optical encoder that only actually reports, it might actually that the signal, it might be that the signal Y of T is actually, you know, it's only got a finite resolution on your encoder. So if you zoom in, you might actually see staircase in your signal, even though the true, um, the true system might have gone through a nice smooth trajectory, right? That's going to mess up everything in terms of your analysis. Your gradients have all just become zero, right? Uh, so you have to make choices about how to, to analyze these things. Um, there's actuator backlash. That's a big one. And then, um, and stiction. And these things turn my simple, smooth, dynamical system into a hybrid system with stick slip physics, um, even between the actuator and the, and the joints. Okay. So I just kind of want to um, remind you of these things that although we've done a lot of beautiful analysis on simple models and, and the like, that when you do get your hands on the robots, things do get messy again. And so all of the clean thinking that we've done on simple models applies. I think the right way to handle stiction is thinking about it as the stick slip dynamics or to engineer it out of your system. But, um, uh, you know, but I just want to sort of remind you that there are details there. Things get harder does, fast. Does Drake like yeah. model these things automatically for like backlash and stiction, or do you have to tweak your model so that you can kind of try to replicate like real life backlash in Drake? Or so the yeah, I mean the ideal is that we have like every possible kind of noise model you'd want in a library of blocks that you would throw in, and like we do have the encoder one that we, you can you can set it to be quantized, or you can set it to have calibration offsets, and you can pop that in there. Um, you know, I think you will certainly, we're still growing that library of, of modeling errors. There's a lot to model, especially if you care about, um, like if you want to model a LIDAR sensor, right? Then, then there's, you know, like a LIDAR tracking a car, you know, is going to be, have a noise affected by the exhaust plume of the car in front of you, right? Like the particles coming out of the exhaust pipe of this thing are going to screw up my LIDAR returns. And so there's sort of arbitrary richness you can add, and it's definitely not a solved problem. But it definitely it won't add anything without you knowing. It's um, it's always about keeping the simple models simple and then giving you a library if you want to add more. Okay, so um, so we remember we said that the Kalman filter is the optimal gain optimal observer gains, just like 
the LQRs, the optimal feedback gains, you know, for linear Gaussian systems. And then the amazing result, which is sort of the, the classic result that um, from output feedback is that for linear Gaussian systems, LQG, linear Gaussian systems with a quadratic regulator cost. So if I wanna minimize my um, expected value of my LQR cost, if I did it over in, in discrete time, You know the drill here. Um, <clears throat> the amazing thing that happens is that the optimal optimal solution is the Kalman filter for an observer plus the LQR state feedback. That didn't need to be true, right? In general, if you're trying to say, I want to, I just want, I have a noisy system, I have noisy observations, I need a controller, I need an observer, or whatever. It didn't have to be the true, the case that you could design your ob observer full stop, design your controller, pretending there's no uh, measurement problems, full stop, put them together and the so solution's optimal. It's, um, it happens to be true for linear quadratic Gaussian problems, uh, and it's magical and it's good. But it's also, um, I think, led to everybody in the world having one team doing state estimation and another team doing control design, pretending that the problems are separable and they're actually not in general. Um, and so that can lead to problems, okay? But this is called the separation principle. fact that you can separate the observer design from the control design and it's it's magical and it's good but it's only it's it only actually optimal for the linear Gaussian systems and there's lots of good examples and lots of good research and lots of research at MIT or CSAIL you know that that talks about what you have to do when those things those assumptions break down Okay, that was our warm up. I, I can't talk about op output feedback without mentioning the LQG result. But I'd like to think, um, you know, more broadly about what's what's happening here. Okay, so um, there's sort of even this, what just happened, the LQR, the Kalman filter plus LQR. Um, there's sort of two views of it. The, the one I gave you explicitly here is that I have my observations and my inputs. Um, coming into my Kalman filter. I have X hat in the middle, and then I have my LQR policy. Okay, but, and that, like you said, there's, there's some states here, four states for the Acrobat example, okay? But the more general view of that, is to forget about this distinction of observer-based feedback and just say really what we've got going on here, if I lump this into one system here, is I have a dynamic controller. That has its own state. And it takes in Y and it puts out U. And it's got some its own state inside. It happens in the case we've already done that um, that, that state is exactly the, the Kalman filters estimate. But more generally, even the linear dynamical systems case, if I think about the controller having state, if I have a dynamical system, then I have some A matrix talking about the evolution of my controller state. 
B matrix. I'm using a subscript C for controller. Right, and for the LQR plus common filter, then really, you know, DC equals was just a different way to write my negative K. That's where my negative K came in. You know, AC, if just I were to write it in this form, then AC looks like my A minus LC. But I could have just taken those two equations and put them all into and just described them as one dynamical system. And you can similarly figure out what BC, B, C, and CC had to be in order to write it in this form. Okay. And I, I'd like you to think about, um, you know, controllers should not be necessarily be static functions of the state, right? That's a limited view of the world. And I, I'm sort of, I always regret that we get so far through the semester and, I, and we really have this picture of like controller as a function. A, a controller should be a living thing, right? It should be a dynamical system. And um, it actually, it, in some weird ways, it, it used to be that way, right? So um, before there was optimization-based control, before we talked about Bellman equations and the like, um, people did, uh, you know, frequency domain control design and loop shaping and things like this, right? And and that was always about setting the poles and zeros of my transfer function. And in sense, in some sense, my controller was always a dynamical system. And it's kind of weird that we lost that, right? It is true, the Bellman equation tells us that it's true that the optimal controller can be written in the noise-free case, right? In the fully observable state observation case, can be written as a controller that's a function of the state. But that doesn't mean that's a good way to write it, right? Um, it could actually be that even for full state feedback, Acrobat, whatever, there might be a much nicer, much simpler way to write the controller that just has a few state variables instead of some weird complicated function that we wrote over the state space. Um, so that's that's kind of a big point that I don't know if I can really convince. I don't like I don't have a, a great way to convince you of that. Um, but that's but I but I feel strongly about that. I feel like um, like we've said it a few times over the over the course of the term. So value functions, you know, of course, like value functions are magical and good because they tell you everything there is to know about you need to know about the future and to make your your instantaneous control decision but they can be really ugly functions of state, right? Really bad. So they might actually not be the right thing to learn, right? Even though they can, they can contain the right information if you find the right thing, but um, maybe there's a better representation. And I, and I think there's a lot of uh, reasons to believe that here. So um, for instance, I mean, my, one of my favorite controllers we've talked about all term, right? Was, was Mark Rabert's control, his hopping control, right? Raybert's hopping controller, if you wrote that as a function of state space, might be pretty ugly, but it, he didn't write it as a function of state space. He had a state machine controller, right? You remember the little um, diagrams that's like, I'm in flight. Okay, I'm, I'm about to land. I'm about to, you know, I'm in, I'm in touchdown. I'm in, I'm in stance. I'm going to push off, right? And in each of those different states, he had a very simple controller, and that made it beautiful and good, right? But that is a dynamic controller. His controller had to remember and that's a, a simple form of it. His controller had to remember what the which mode it's in currently, right? In order to make its next decision. But once it adds that one sort of, if you think of it as like one discrete variable that you've added um, to the, the system, then the controller is actually pretty easy. So unfortunately, we don't talk a lot about how do you find those controllers? How do you parameterize those controllers? What's the right way? But we sort of could, and maybe we are a little bit if you think about the implications of this for RL, let's say, or let me say for controllers as a neural network, right? Once again, following what we just said last time, you, you, you have a choice to make if you want to have a dynamic controller 
right? Most people doing learning control with neural networks don't have an explicit block that is their state estimator. They have some, in some way, written a dynamic controller. And just like in the dynamical system case, there's a couple choices you could make, right? You can have your controller, say control network, policy network. I guess it's called policy in that world. My policy network, right? I can take in my command, my um, my observations y, my maybe my previous inputs, but I could take y of n, y of n minus one, y of n minus two, and output a u of n. And the way to think about this is this is a dynamical system. This is a, a one way to write a dynamical system, but it's written in sort of the input output form. ARX form, especially because we end up having to pass back U N minus one, U N minus two, potentially. Okay, the analogy there is, is strong, right? So we, when you're doing that, you're giving your policy some ability to do some, some estimation inside it. Similarly, if your policy network Could it could be in state space form? E.g. using LSTMs. Didn't mean to verbally say E.g. but um, And that could take a, a history of Y's. Or just, sorry, the current Y and have a running U um, coming out, but it's got some internal state. For the hopper controller, that's a dynamic. I mean, that doesn't have internal state. It just uses the current state to determine what it's. The internal state it has is which mode am I in? Which is a function of the state, but. Right. Almost okay. always. Mm -hmm. I, so actually, um, I hope I didn't. I, I wrote a stateless version of it that was. Um, I didn't put it in the notes, I don't think. But I, I you might have found my code that has a stateless version of it that. Um, because you can make a close approximation of Raybert's controller using that, but it's more fragile than if you ran Raybert's controller with the state machine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's something very stabilizing, very robust about having made a discrete decision and sticking with it, especially when you're thinking about contact, like the transition, if you were to try to estimate, am I, is my foot on the ground or not? And make a completely different decision based on if it's on the ground or not, and you have any noise, then things can get very bad right when your foot's about to touch the ground, okay? It's actually way more robust to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'm, on, I think I'm in the air, I think I'm in the air, okay, I'm gonna make a discrete decision to change and say, now I think I'm in the ground, on the ground, and I won't reverse that decision. I can only go that other way around the diagram. And that makes me much more, much less sensitive to noise, okay? You actually see that a lot in walking robots is that, um, people will, there's a lot of hacks right around the moment of contact. So, so you'll see, we, uh, we've, I've had, I've had robots I'm proud of that basically close their eyes and pretend they don't have any sensor observations right when they're close to the ground because it's better to just power through than to have some noisy estimate coming back through, you know, just because we hadn't done a good enough job on the state estimation. Okay, but that's a symptom I think uh, well, I think, yeah, either we didn't do a good enough job of a, on the state estimation or we should have been writing a dynamic controller. Thank you for asking that. I think that that is a really subtle and important point, yeah. Okay, so does this connection, I mean, maybe it's it's obvious, maybe it's, it's clear, but does it, um, does that land? I mean, I think, there are implications about whether you choose to take a history of observations into your policy network or just have an internal state in your policy network, right? Uh, we, we, and I think you can really understand them through the same conversation from last time, like the ARX versus the state space models, right? For instance, ARX would be very inefficient if you had to remember the, do I have the key 
to unlock the red door or whatever example I gave last time. So, um, and the LSTMs might be better at that, but um, the LSTMs might be much harder to, to fit. Okay, so um, there are ways to do the, if you start thinking about the system as a dynamical system and, and stop thinking about it as a call and filter, full stop feedback controller, then even in the linear setting, there are ways to do joint feedback and um, observation, you know, filter and feedback design, joint perception and control. And honestly, um, it took me a long time to fully appreciate that these things existed, even though they've existed for a while. And some, some of them I feel like were right under my nose, but, but um, I think a lot of people in robotics have been complaining for a long time that we don't know how to do joint perception and control. Um, and for linear dynamical systems, that's actually not true. We actually do know how to do uh, joint perception and control. And I think um, we, should, we should understand that and generalize from it. Um, so, right. Uh, the more general approach, if you will, call it joint perception and control, if you will. That's a little bit of a leap from my linear equations, but uh, just to make the make the point, uh, <clears throat> would be to search. You know, is to optimize over some sort of dynamic parameterization of your controller directly. I'll optimize over the controller written as a dynamical system. And that's effectively solving for K and L at the same time, you know, but it could be a more complicated combination of it, right? And in the simple case, just like we've seen it over and over again, right? So for like a simple Lyapunov function, I wouldn't ever want to write a hard optimization for that. I can just solve a Lyapunov function for, for a simple linear system, x dot equals ax, I can just solve a Lyapunov equation. But there's also a way to write that as a semi-definite program. And that gave us the ability to, for instance, do robust Lyapunov functions, right? Um, same sort of thing is going to happen here. The, the first uh, idea is just going to, is a different way, an optimization way to, to solve for a, b, c, you know, the controller dynamical system. And it, if, if you've coded it up right, it should just give you back what you would have gotten if you had solved the Kalman filter and the, the, the LQR. But the power comes in that it's a much more general um, tool if you want to combine it with other objectives, if you want to do a robust LQR observer, you know, whatever, there's ways to, to extend it where the Riccati equations will eventually give out. So um, when, I, when I was planning this morning, I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna teach the four different ways to do this. And then I realized that was just like, would totally flood you with equations and you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't like me probably. So, so I decided to back up and give examples and, but I want you to, to know that these things exist and let me at least name them and I'll put the equations in the notes, right? It's rather than write them all here. So, um, so I'd say there's kind of four general approaches to this. So I'd say the first one is, is a Riccati equation type approach. And there are general, um, there are more general versions of the um, Kalman filter um, plus LQR Riccati equations that do H2, H infinity, just classic. Um, John Doyle papers on this that I will cite, okay? That's the most similar, but there are, just to know that you can push the Riccati equations a little farther, a little harder to get, um, to get good things out, okay? Um, <clears throat> the second approach, you can actually write a semi-definite program or you can use linear matrix inequalities. There's an SDP formulation for dynamic controller design.
which optimizes AC, BC, and all these things directly. I added already this morning, and I will keep adding um, the the LQR um, as an LMI. There's a there's a way to design LQR as a semi-definite programming. We also had a previously seen Lyapunov as a semi-definite program. And it's gonna, it follows in this line of thinking. It's a more complicated setup, but you can write the dynamic joint um, estimation and control, if you will, uh, as an STP. And one of the beautiful magical things that happens here, okay, Um, the problem that you write down changes as you change the size of the, of the internal state of your controller. Okay, so for instance, if I'm parameterizing A, B, C, and D, then I, I need to make a choice in order to write that parameterization based on the dimension of the internal state of the controller. And in particular, if I were to choose the dimension of the internal state of the controller to be XC, then this is the static feedback case and we know it's hard. So the equations that you write down in this sort of formulation, you can look at them and when you've chosen XC equals zero, it's not a convex optimization. The, the, mag, the dimension of XC equals zero. Okay. And then as you increase XC, it stays a hard problem until the dimension of XC is greater than or equal to the dimension of the plant state X. Then it becomes convex. Okay, so the problem somehow gets easier when your dynamic controller that you're searching over has enough state variables to be a full state estimator. So it's, it's sort of a I don't know, it's, it's a, I find it very beautiful that the math works out this way, okay? Um, and the way that that happens, actually the formulation you write down doesn't actually change, okay? But the, the equations you write down have a rank constraint, okay? A rank constraint in the optimization becomes trivially true and can be removed. All right, you kind of wonder like, how could my, why would my equations change discontinuously? You know, if I write down one formulation and I change that X, what would, why would it be convex in one case and not convex? But the reason that happens is because there is, when you write down the formulation, there's one line in your optimization says rank, you know, X is whatever, and, uh, and, that becomes trivially true as you once you increase the order of the uh, of the controller to match the order of the plant and for anything higher, right? So this is just amazing. So so somehow choosing a, a controller that has enough states to be a state estimator isn't, and then doing dynamic control design is actually an easier problem than doing this sort of static output feedback or smaller output feedbacks. Okay. Um, the third approach that, that um, has gotten more attention again recently is um, what I'll call it the disturbance-based feedback parameterization. Uh, it's also called the EULA parameters. Um, it's these days, it's called, there's a very similar um, systems level synthesis. We saw this already for the state, state feedback case in the LQR. Um, I had an example of how LQR can be written as a convex optimization uh, already in that case. All right, and that, that will extend with some, um, a few caveats that are too detailed for the moment, but, um, but th that does extend to the output feedback design case, okay? 
And the fourth one, which is sort of on the, um, the fringe of our understanding, I thought we kind of understand it would be to do, to try to do gradient descent. This might be the one that is interesting. <clears throat> directly on, for instance, AC, BC, right? This would be analogous to when we stopped and talked about the policy search. I told you, yeah, you can actually search directly in K and it will find, gradient descent will find the right answer. You know, there, um, there are some things you can say about the dynamic state feedback case too. And I think we're, the world is putting all these results together and, and understanding exactly the rates, uh, maybe not rates, asymptotics, I think, at least of that, of that uh, idea. Okay, so despite having given like a bunch of talks over my career saying joint perception and control is hard, I mean that is certainly true in the in the uh, general case. But I should have always said with a caveat, except if you're a linear dynamical system, then we actually have some pretty darn good solutions. Okay, and I think not enough people appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, um, for the fully non-linear setting, the, the, the problem can potentially get very hard very fast, okay? Um, this is, um, a POM DP, for those of you that don't think about those a lot, partially, observable Markov decision process, right? I'm just gonna get lazy and write just MDP. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, I mean, we norm, a lot of times we think about POMDPs as being in a discrete state action and observation space. You can certainly think about the same thing in a continuous um, uh, space, right? And actually, you know, all, a lot of the tools that we have here uh, still work. So there's a, that's like a whole nother lecture, but, but I, I, I do think that it's important to realize that, um, that this output feedback problem is really just the POMDP problem. There are good approaches from control to, to address that problem, not in the, um, let's say Leslie and Tomas uh, um, full you know, solving puzzles uh, POMDP kind of case. That's, that would be very hard, let's say for, um, you know, that some of the discrete POMDP's success stories would be very hard to, to get with a linear feedback. But the controls community, for instance, has thought a lot about um, suboptimal control, where you search over, you're basically doing policy search, let's say, for an um, output feedback controller, in a, you know, but you're admitting that it's suboptimal and, and, and not doing the full, uh, the full POMDP solution. And there's results there that are, that are good. You can do trajectory optimization for POMDPs. You can do iterative LQG is a good way to do trajectory optimization for, um, for POMDPs. Okay, so a lot of the tools you can kind of say, if you were to just embrace the fact that we have a POMDP, the state space, I, I, mean, I will only say this for people that know, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, but the, the state space is the belief space. I have a dynamics of my belief space and you can almost walk through the lectures we've gone through and ask, you know, does this apply? And you'll get more yeses than, than you'd think. And I would even argue, I've, I've argued with Leslie and Tomas, who, uh, Leslie Kelbling, Tomas, and Lana Perez, who are good friends who talk a lot about um, belief space. Uh, you know, I've tried to convince them that the reason belief space is difficult is because it's underactuated, right? Roughly, because you never have enough actuators to control your full belief distribution. And it's the analogy is maybe, um, I think real. Okay, I, do, I wanna spend just a, a few minutes here at the end, um, kind of wrapping up and giving you, uh, you know, maybe a sense for where we've been and, and what I feel like we covered and didn't cover, but only, you know, at a, at a sort of high level here. So um, let me spend a few minutes on course wrap up. I'll take any questions about that before I, before I do. Um, I guess I've had the I've had this paper belief space planning assuming maximum likelihood observations open on my computer forever and I'm yet to read it but I guess this would probably be the best lead-in 
Sure. That's a that's a trajectory optimization of belief space. It's a good example. Um, that was the one. That that was the one when we when Leslie Tomas, Rob Blad, and I were working on that. That I was trying to convince them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now that you've seen it all. Um, let me say again what I think the course is, and you can tell me if you agree, <laughs> okay? Right, I think that this is a course uh, roughly on nonlinear dynamics and control, right? With a big optimization vent. And I think it's almost synonymous with these days with what people are, are calling model-based reinforcement learning. Not, not entirely, but I think it's the set of things that you, um, you know, we, we cover a lot of the set of things that I hope you know, you, tools that you should have in your toolkit if, you're, if you have a model and you're trying to solve these problems, okay? Um, I sort of want to, especially since I did a bunch of it today, I sort of want to justify the, or, or just give you the philosophy behind why we've talked about linear systems so many times, right? So I'd say for almost all problems, we've, I'll just say it, I won't write it. Like for almost all problems um, that we've talked about, I've tried to pick uh, the algorithms the versions of the algorithms that I think are going to solve the hard problems, the you know that are going to be relevant to the hard problems, whether it's the walking robots or whatever, the nonlinear systems. Okay, um, and I've excluded results from linear control that I think just don't have. Like we didn't talk at all about frequency domain approaches to linear control because those are harder to map over. Okay, but uh, I think there are when, when we when considering the nonlinear control approaches. You can almost always take linear control as a special case and connect to a wealth of knowledge and literature there that you can try to pull back to, to the nonlinear setting. Okay, so as sort of a philosophy, partly for teaching it, but also for thinking about it in my research, I find it very important to say, okay, what's the super hard thing we're trying to do? How does it work in the linear setting? Because if it doesn't do the right thing there, it's not gonna work, probably not gonna work in the full setting. Okay, so I get in trouble with that philosophy sometimes, but, but I, I, I think it mostly has served me well, okay? There's another setting where you can sometimes reduce to and understand. I think the two, case, the two corner cases where we, we have very satisfying solutions are those sort of linear Gaussian systems, and the other one is where you have discrete states, observations, and, and, and inputs, right? Where it's fully discrete, and then you, you have like the POM DPs, and you have Markov decision processes, and you have lots of results you can lean on. And most of the time you can take your algorithms down and look at them through that lens and learn something about this harder, harder problem. Okay, so, um, and it, I really think there's a bunch of, of important results that we have for linear systems or discrete systems that should generalize to nonlinear. And we just haven't done it as a field yet. Like they're, they're just kind of waiting for us. I mean, sums of squares was this beautiful way to take the quadratic form and just, okay, play the kernel trick. And now suddenly it's, we're solving nonlinear systems. And there's just a bunch more of those waiting. Um, and we, we kind of have to just let you guys have to do the work, okay? Um, <clears throat> I do think that nonlinear, you know, brings, brings important different challenges that aren't always visible in the linear systems, right? So I'm not, definitely not saying only think about linear, um, but once you're interested, once you're into the, you've got your teeth in the nonlinear problem, just ask what would it do for a linear system? Okay, but then in that space, it really, um, we, we were able to formulate a bunch of different uh, problems. We, I spent more time than normal this term on system identification, right? Uh, <clears throat> but, but if it's, you know, feedback design, planning, trajectory optimization type things, Lyapunov verification, They're all just sort of minor tweaks <clears throat> on thinking about, on putting your teeth into this problem of thinking about the dynamics written in this sort of state space form, right? And we've slowly added in W and we've slowly added in 
output, but really all of these problems, it's so easy, I think, um, to look at your walking robot and see something super complex and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. But, but almost always you can think about it as it's just a nonlinear dynamical system. What features does it have? What tools can I bring to bear? Um, and there's, there's typically very general approaches to, to, there's kind of right answers, I think, in a lot of these hard problems. Okay, so, you know, uh, state estimation is trying to find X in the, by, you know, examining these equations, you've got a bunch of U data and Y data, you're trying to find X. You know, control design is trying to find U as a function of X, for instance. I mean, all these things are just a simple, um, are, are understood clearly through the lens of those equations. So if I project forward, you know, like what, what do I feel like we haven't done or we haven't done well, or what, where's the field going, right? I think um, if I, if to say, I mean, I know I've been philosophical the whole lecture, but even more philosophically, I, I would say that, um, that control theory has, um, okay. I think a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve in robotics today are actually pretty simple, okay? And I think so far, um, controls has focused on what makes hard problems really hard. And uh, we have, I think we're only now starting to spend more time on what makes the simple problems simple. So like manipulation is really should not be a hard problem, okay? But if you write down all the equations the way we tend to write them down and you ask the synthesis questions the way we tend to ask the synthesis questions, it looks like a mess, a total mess of, of contact mechanics and, and, and hybrid systems and the like. And somehow um, that should be a simple problem. Like Raybert did, did a great job of making the hopping problem that we could have spent uh, 10 years talking about uh, how hard that problem was, or you could just write down the controller and it works fine and it's great, <laughs> right? And so I think the trend has started to be like, okay, maybe it, real world instances of these problems are actually not that hard. So there's theoretical work to do to understand, I think, what makes real problem instances different from the worst case instances that we are talking about. I think RL has pushed that in a beautiful way because they're, they are, RL is solving some of the easier problems and making, reminding us, hey, you know, some of these problems aren't that hard. But I think RL is leaving a lot of knowledge and, and uh, optimization power uh, you know, on the side. I think the, the hopefully we'll, we'll get the best of both worlds. <clears throat> I also think, um, you know, oh my God, if you come back in a couple of years, I hope I have a better answer for control through contact. We gave you a bunch of answers, you know, uh, I told you what we know how to do, uh, but that one's on me. I feel like we got to do a better job on that. And uh, I've been working on it for a number of years and it's going to pop and we're going to feel, we're going to be able to do much. Like I said, this, these manipulation tasks are, uh, are not hard problems from, from a, complexity standpoint, but we're somehow making them hard. So what I've been talking about intuitive physics or approximate control and stuff like this, something in that landscape has to make these problems look easy again. And I had a really good question in one of the robust control, um, at the end of the robust control uh, mini lecture that, um, you know, I think even though I keep talking about things that add complexity and, you know, here's a new um, concern, you might have it to be worst case against this disturbance or whatever, I think in my dream world, if once we've added, we've asked the right question, you know, saying you're robust to, the, to all the, the important things and your problem space is distributed, the real world is distributed. At some point when we've got it right, the optimizer, maybe it spends a while thinking about it, but it's to kick out something very simple uh, because I think these control problems really just aren't that hard. Uh, and I, don't, I, I think you could store them in a deep neural network and I think it's great that we can, but I think you probably don't need to if we're doing our job really well. Uh, most of these things are pretty simple. Okay. Um, any questions? So I am super excited about Thursday. Um, please consider, I, I made it optional that you, you know, to share the video with everybody here, but um, uh, please consider doing that. I think it's so much fun. Every year, people say the best part of the class was watching the project presentations because you learn about what works, what doesn't work, um, actually. So please consider sharing your experiences.
encore. I 